So I decided to make a video about my day uh, having Briggs. Um, and I thought a lot about this mainly because I found a lot of peace and hope and faith in other people's stillbirth stories. Um, in the word stillbirth has been difficult for me to say because I just like I just don't think of it as a stillbirth I think of it as my son and child being born um, but regardless I'll probably do a lot of rambling I'll go back and forth between subjects because those that know me best know that I'm just all over the place I'm ADD when it comes to like being on a certain subject um, but anyways I looked at like a lot of stories about stillbirth and um, it helped me to cope and grieve and it helped me understand understand a, f a totally foreign subject something that I never like imagined in my entire life never um, and I like absolutely thank those people so much for sharing um, because it's so hard and there's gonna be either I was gonna say either a lot of crying or no crying at all I've had five weeks to dwell on this um, and to live it but as you can tell there's crying which is weird for me and odd for me if you know me because I don't cry I'll correct that I cry for other people um, because I love people but I never cry for myself it's just not something I do because I'm a super positive person um, and I'm a strong believer in and things that happen happen and they teach us a lesson and that's very hard to say right now <laughs> because no one needs this to have a lesson in life um, but anyways so I watched a lot of videos as well on stillbirth and there was a couple two or three videos that I watched that were that just really resonated with me um, and I said, wow, I'm so thankful that these people decided to make a video about their story because I would have no idea. I would have no comparison because people don't talk about this. It's not something that happens a lot. Um, of course, I looked up the statistics. Uh, I looked up the numbers. Um, and about one in four women have either miscarriage or stillbirth. I'm one in four, but I'm also one in a hundred. One in 125. Uh, I don't know the exact statistics, but that is it. I'm the 1% of a pregnancy that ends in stillbirth. And that makes me angry <laughs> because it's that's just ridiculous. Um, and I, I never thought this would happen. And everyone just, they talk about the 12 weeks and they say, you know, don't announce your pregnancy until you get back past the 12 weeks. Like, you know, the, um, the risk of miscarriage is super high. And like, that's all people talk about is they talk about that 12 weeks and I got past that 12 weeks, um, thankfully, and gratefully, I got past that 12 weeks. I got to 38 weeks. And so I'm going to share, like, those 38 weeks with you and just, I think, share, like, my entire pregnancy journey. And I am doing that because I found so much value in those people who made videos and although like people are probably super confused as to like 
why I would ever watch videos of these stories when I've lived it. Um, it really helped a lot. But there are so few of them. And I wanted more. And I wanted to watch more videos and I wanted to read more stories. But I can't because it's either not talked about or there's just not enough women who are sharing their stories. And so I was like, I think it's just super important to share mine. And it's not because I need or want the attention. It's literally solely to help like raise awareness and have other people under understand a little bit more about what this is and what this was semi like. Um, and you'll never understand unless you've experienced it. And I never want any of my friends or family to join me in this terrible grief. Um, and as someone put it, <laughs> this terrible club, it's the worst club to be a part of. You don't want to be a part of my club. And normally I really want you to be a part of my club because I love people and company, but I don't want company here. <laughs> It's super lonely. Um, I'll cry a lot, but that's good because people don't see me cry and I think I'm super in tune with my emotions and I think it's okay to cry. And to show you the grief and pain that I'm going through. There's going to be so much starting and stopping because it's so funny. Before I started recording this, I was like, I'm going to be fine. Like, I've thought about this for so long, but clearly that is not the case. <laughs> um, so I'll just talk about April 30th, 2020, the day Briggs was born. And he had such a badass name that I'm so pissed. <laughs> I'm so mad. Because <laughs> it was the coolest ever. And I was so proud of myself for thinking of such a cool name. <laughs> uh, but April 30th, if, we're, if you're watching this in present day, we're in a quarantine, right? Coronavirus. Um, so I had a doctor's appointment. And it was, you know, in the afternoon, my husband couldn't be in the room with me. Um, so that was really tough. But I asked him to drive me. And I asked him to drive me because I thought I was having contractions. First time mom, no idea what contractions are or what they're supposed to feel like, right? Like everyone's like, oh, you'll know, you know. And I was like, how do you know? Um... But now I know. Uh, so 38 weeks, I was um, having contractions. I had started on a Wednesday. So he had, was born on Thursday. So Wednesday night, I started having contractions. Um, but I was able to sleep. I wasn't too concerned because, you know, they say count. Um, you want them to be five to seven minutes apart and they should last for an hour that long. And it just wasn't there like that. I, I just wasn't concerned. So I was like, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to labor here uh, for a while, I suppose. And then I'll call if I need to call. But I have a doctor's appointment, so I'm fine. I'm going to just wait it out and uh, hopefully we make it to the doctor's appointment because I was getting an ultrasound. Uh, so for those of you who have been pregnant or know the process of pregnancy, you usually only get two ultrasounds, um, one when they first find out that you're pregnant and then one when you find out the gender. You can opt to have a third ultrasound if you're doing some sort, um, sort of genetic testing. So we actually did have three ultrasounds uh, to check for Down syndrome, which he did not have. Um, so we were able to see Briggs three times through ultrasounds. Uh, and so I knew I was having an ultrasound. And the reason I was having an ultrasound was because at my 37-week appointment, 
he was measuring small. Uh, and so they measure your belly and, and they try to, you know, understand like what baby is going to weigh when they're born. And I was getting close to having him. So once get an estimate, they also want to make sure he's healthy and he's measuring on track. Um, so the last doctor's appointment at 37 weeks, we checked his heartbeat, which was strong. Um, and then we checked to see how he was measuring um, and, he, and they thought he was so small so they wanted to just check and I I it was literally nine days in between that 37 week appointment and that 38 week appointment um, that I had to wait to get an ultrasound but I wasn't nervous I was nervous at first um, but, you know, people come to me and they're like, if they thought it was something super worrisome, you would be going in right away. And I was like, okay, yep, yep. Um, so I knew I was getting this ultrasound. I was having contractions. And so I, I go into my appointment alone. My husband's waiting in the car because I asked him to drive me because I was like, they're going to send me to the hospital. I'm totally in labor. On the way to the, to the doctor's appointment, I actually, they got really close, so I had three in a half hour, which was the most that I've ever had, and they were getting stronger. Um, so I got brought in, I got brought back, uh, and as soon as I was going to go lay down for the ultrasound, um, I had another really big contraction, and the lady said, oh no, like we're not going to do the ultrasound. The doctor's probably just going to want to see you. And I was like, come on. Like, I just want to see this ultrasound. I just want to make sure Briggs is okay. And as awful as this is to say, I'm super glad it happened the way it did. So I went back to the doctor's office, the exam room. And I started having contractions again. And they were a minute and 30 seconds long. And they were about five minutes apart. And so he was going to check if I was dilated. Um, and so like I hopped up. They, they did that. And I was about two centimeters dilated. Um, and then he went to go check for heartbeat. And there was no heartbeat. And honestly, in the moment, I didn't think anything of it. I literally did not blink an eye because I didn't know what was happening. And I'm not, I didn't worry at all really during my pregnancy. And I really try. It's funny because I have anxiety and like panic attacks, but I've had, I've had none of them lately. Um, and when he couldn't find his heartbeat, I just didn't think of an, cause like who, like, you know, like I'm a first time mom. I obviously know baby's supposed to have a heartbeat, but who knows, right? And so I wasn't worried. He then brought out like some other machine so that he could hear him, um, you know, like in a different machine. And so he's like, oh, I like, I think I, f I found it. Like, so he was pretty sure that he found the heartbeat. And I said, well, let me, let me hear. Like, so now you found it. And he was pretty low. So like, you know, it was very low when he thought that he found the heartbeat. And, uh, and so I was like, let me just listen so that I could hear. Cause at that point I did start to get a little worried. Um, and then we couldn't hear anything. There was silence. So they said, well, let's go to the ultrasound room. So I hopped up and I went to the ultrasound room and I laid down and it was the fastest, oddest thing ever. Um, 
they put, you know, they did the ultrasound and you could see there was no heartbeat. So I saw him and that's when they said, I'm so sorry, like, there's no heartbeat. And I was just like, what? Like, I was so confused. Literally, like, so confused because I didn't understand. I literally, like, I, I understand, like, the words that are coming out of their mouths. But I was so confused. I was just like, what do you mean? Like, I'm, like, I don't get it. And mind you, I'm by myself. So my husband wasn't there. Um, and I just remember saying to the doctor, like, what the F? Like, obviously, I said the swear word. And I just, I got up and I was like, what do you, like, what the F? Like, what? Like, and that's all I remember saying in the room. And then they were like, do you have someone we can call? And I was like, my husband is in the car. Like, um, and I just remember like, just telling him to come inside and get me. And he had no idea, obviously, what was going on. And so, he comes in to get me. And I don't even think I was, like, crying at that point. I'm, I'm literally not even sure. Like, I don't know if I was crying. And I just remember, like, literally, like, running out of the doctor's office. And I just said, let's go. Like, we have to go to the hospital. Um... Because they sent me to the hospital. I was in, I was literally in labor. And so we get to the hospital. Or we, I'm sorry, we, we walk down the stairs. And I'm going to give you the full details. Because I remember every second of this day. Like every second. And so we walk down the stairs. And, and he's like confused. Because I, I don't even think I said it yet. Like. He's just like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I just remember like wrapping him and hunching over, like <laughs> literally going to vomit. I just said like, he, he's not here. He doesn't have a heartbeat. <laughs> like he just doesn't have a heartbeat. And like, he's not like, we don't have a son anymore. <laughs> And I literally was like hunching over and I was like, literally going to vomit everywhere because I just, I just was, I couldn't believe it. And I don't know how, but I just, I was still in shock. So um, I just climbed in the truck and I said like, let's go, like, let's go to the hospital. We had nothing, so we didn't. We didn't have clothes, we didn't have anything with us. Um, I'm kind of thankful for that because before I had asked him to grab, I was like, you think we should grab, you know, the hospital bag and our bags? Cause like, I really think I'm a neighbor. And he's like, no. He was like, no, you're not, no, you're not. <laughs> I remember on the way to the hospital, like I was swearing at him because he was like, you're not having attraction, stop it. And I was like, you know, like, you know, any pregnant woman who knows and has contractions, like not the thing to say to someone. Um, and he was saying all the wrong things. So hopefully, you know, I'll know for next time. Uh, so we get to the hospital and I want you to imagine with me, like, you have all of these things in place it's not a normal, I'm going to walk into the hospital and I'm just going to go up there. Like, it seemed like the longest process ever because no one knew what was going on. I walked into the hospital where there was like a police officer standing there. Um, there was nurses. There was, you know, they needed to take your temperature. You had to do, which 
is fine, you know, like you have to do all these protocols. Um, and I didn't like yell or scream, I wasn't even crying, I just, you know, we did them and we were like, do you want a wheelchair to go up there? And I was like, no, I'm fine. Um, and we just went up and we were pretty silent the whole cart ride. Um, and so, you know, um, just think about like the longest moments of my life. <laughs> just, I just wanted to get up to the hospital bed and and I couldn't because I just, we had to do all of these things and no one knew, right? Like no one knew what was going on. So we get up to labor and delivery and we press the button to go in. And I just said, you know, my name and they immediately let me in. So the doctor had called them and I told them what was going on because um, I was met by a nurse who just hugged me and walked me down to the room. And so obviously the doctors had called them and told them what was happening. And he went in, I don't even remember what happened. Um, and I just sat there. And they were just, I don't, I don't really remember a ton of the conversation, obviously, because I was in, in shock. Uh, and I just remember saying, like, okay, I, I have to have my, my baby, right? And, um, yeah. <laughs> she was incredibly kind. I don't remember her name, but I thank you. <laughs> and, uh, I just was like, I, I just don't get what's happening. And she had asked, like, if we wanted to call, if we wanted to call anyone, and um, she, like, she would be happy to make those calls for us. And it was like, no, you know, we'll do it. And so I called my sister. Um, I called my sister Amanda first and I just said you know he doesn't have a heartbeat I, I can't remember if I was like sobbing in this moment I think I was um, and the phone calls were like super quick I was just like he doesn't have a heartbeat I have to go like I just gotta go um, but she had wanted to or I had asked her to call my aunt, who is, um, and my mom, but my aunt, who's, uh, I'm very close with, and she is, she is practically my mother. So I asked her to call her, and then I called my other sister, Chelsea, and I told her. Um, and both of them, I'm sure, were just, like, in disbelief, right? You never think about getting that phone call. I was supposed to have a healthy, happy nephew for them. And I think I called, I can't remember if I called his godmom, um, but I think I did call her before everything happened, before I had him. And then of course, you know, my husband called his mom. And uh, so we told her, and uh, so we got the phone calls. They were so quick. I mean, I just I don't even remember what I said, and then, um, which is fine. Uh, so we got those phone calls all the way, and the the nurse was like, "We'll make you comfortable." Um, 
you know, as comfortable as possible. We know you don't want to feel any pain. And I was like, yeah, of course. Like, of course, I, I don't want to feel anything. I don't want to be here in this moment. And so I can't remember if I met with the doctor first or, or whatever. But I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> like, I just... Oh, gosh. So I immediately, immediately um, asked about a C-section because I couldn't bear the thought of having a child, my son, a child, and he wasn't going to be here. And I was so scared. And so I just was, I was like, I want a C-section, like, I don't want to see anything. I don't want to know anything. I want a C-section. And because I just wanted them to take him out and take him away. Like, that's what I thought was going to happen. Um, and that seems so cruel, right? Like, now that I look back um, and we didn't do that. That seems really cruel and awful. I'm so glad that it didn't happen that way. Uh, so the doctor had come in and, and I had asked her the same thing. I said, I want a C-section. Like, give me a C-section and let's go. Like, let's do it. Uh, and so as a doctor, of course, you have to, like, talk about the risks that are involved and all this stuff. And so... Uh, she just, you know, right off the wrists. And I thank God had this moment of clarity um, that was like, well, what about future babies? Because uh, I, you know, I don't think it happens every time, but it's very likely that if you have a C section the first time, you have to have it the second time and the third, you know. Uh, and in the moment, I was like, thank God I did this, but I was just like, I don't want to have a C-section again, like if I don't have to. Um, so I just was like, I don't know if I decided, I can't remember, um, to have a natural birth, but I think I just was like, or, you know, without a C-section, a vaginal birth. But I just was like, okay, I guess I don't remember. Um, and so I didn't end up having a C-section, but I did say, get me an epidural and I had wanted an epidural before you know some women they want to do to try like a natural birth like they want to try that and um and I was not one of those women <laughs> I was like no way <laughs> I don't think so so um so they had ordered an epidural and uh the I don't know if it's done by anesthesia you know, anesthesiologist, like I'm not sure if it's done by them, um, but I think that's what was said. So they had called him. And, but they did give me something else um, that started with an S to just help me like relax and try to sleep. Um, and so they gave me that and I like was in and out like I it was really weird um, but I just remember having a really big contraction and I said and then after I was like I need to go to the, like I need to use the restroom and so I my husband and the nurse helped me to to use the restroom to get me out because of course I have like IVs in my arm and all this stuff and I'm on this medicine that I probably couldn't walk anyways but I did with their help so I went to the bathroom and now looking back on it uh my water definitely broke while I was going to the bathroom because I heard like and felt a pop and I was getting up to go um back to the bed and I almost didn't make it and I just was screaming, like, he's coming, he's coming. And I kid you not, like, I just made it back on the bed. And I gave birth to my son. Uh, so the 
the epidural didn't make it in time. Um, so I had like a natural birth and the doctor wasn't even in there. And I just remember the nurse like calling for her, like, come, come here, you know, obviously. And um, so I had my son. And I just remember saying, I just remember turning my head and like holding my husband's hand and saying, don't tell me, like, don't tell me what's happening. I don't want to know. And, um, I was like, just don't tell me, like, don't tell me what happened. And I was like saying it in a sense that like, I didn't believe that I had him. And I just like remember my husband like holding my hand the entire time and just saying, it's okay, it's okay. God bless him. Um, and so I, they just took him. And I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to know that he didn't have a heartbeat beforehand. Um, because if I gave birth, he came out and they told me, I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm just not sure, I could even figure out how to do that, but I'm figuring this out, so I'm sure I could have, um, so they cleaned him up, uh, so I think, and they had took him out, and I just remember like not wanting to see him. Um, I don't know like when things happen. I actually, so I got to the hospital. It happened really fast. I got to the hospital at this is borders. That was probably borders. <laughs> I got to the hospital at to something and I had him at 415 so it happened really fast and I remember saying out loud like thank god because uh, we could have been here for 24 hours and I would have been in agony knowing what was happening and I was like well that's the least you can do for me god like thanks and I, like I literally said that out loud like thanks right like that's the least you could do um and so, we didn't see him for a while, and I just remember getting bombarded with questions about if we wanted to hold him, um, and if we wanted to take pictures, and if we want, and I'm like, like, what are you people talking about? Like, no, I'm, I'm like, I don't even know what's going on right now. <laughs> Um, and after a while, I just thought about, like, how much I'd regret not seeing my son. And I was so scared. Like, my friends and family know I hate the human body. I think it's terrible. <laughs> um, and so to see a dead child, a lifeless child, and hold a child that's not going to wake up was the scariest thought and I'm sure if you're watching this you're like yeah geez that seems really scary um and somehow some somewhere along the way we decided to hold him and see him actually so we didn't decide to hold him at first um because I couldn't do it Um, but they wheeled him in, uh, in the crib that a normal baby would be in. And he was so cute. It wasn't scary. I mean, it was, but it wasn't. And, um, the first thing 
I noticed was that he had my husband's nose. <laughs> cute little fat nose. Um, and I just remember like looking at my husband Brad and just like, like he's so cute look at his ugly nose <laughs> he's like I'm so sorry that you have that nose Briggs <laughs> we tend to use humor I use a lot of humor um, in my life because I think that's what gets me through a lot of things and so that was the first thing I noticed. He was wrapped up like a baby. Um, so cute, like so precious. And I didn't like expect that. He, I don't know, like, I didn't expect him to look like a human, <laughs> which is so weird to think about. But he did, which made it that much worse um and so I I was done seeing him and it wasn't that long like it was literally 10 minutes and I like looked at the nurse and I was like okay like I'm done so she took him away and so the next time we had decided we were ready again and another nurse had come on and I told her like I'd seen him once um, and we didn't hold him and so she thankfully shared her story with me he had to go uh, here are the dogs they were barking at someone, um, which is normal. So, I'll start from, that my nurse had, um, sorry, that was a really good break. <laughs> I think I needed that. I'm thankful for my dogs. Um, I, my nurse, my nighttime nurse, uh, she had also you know, understood. And she shared with us that she lost her firstborn at um, 36 weeks. Oh my God, geez, Louise, wow. Uh, so she thankfully just shared with us, like, you know, some people, they push things on you there. Obviously, in this situation, if anyone tried to push anything on me I'd push them but uh, she shared how they took pictures and um, you know they have pictures of their son and it was great to to do to just have pictures of him and, and be able to remember him and um, and then she talked about holding him as well and she talked about her regrets. Um, and I was thankful that she shared. So after that conversation, I just looked at my husband and I said, I really think we should hold him. And it, women are different. Like some women may be thinking I'm crazy right now because they're like, how could you not hold your child? Um, but I literally was so scared. Um, I had no idea, right? Like, I had no idea what was going on. So, we did. He was brought back in and we held him. And it was the greatest. Um, it was the greatest. Holding him. And he was so cute. Like, he just... I just... I can't... Yeah, he was so cute. And my husband held him and super thankful for that. And so uh, he, you know, we said we're done again. Um, and they brought him back out. And then before we had left and before we got discharged, we decided we wanted, or, or my husband said, um, do you want to see him again? And I said, 
I'm all set. Um, but, you know, if you want to see him, please, like, please, like, do. Um, and so it took him a while, but he spoke up again, and he said, you know, I, I do want to see him again because I want to see him unwrapped. So at this point before, we had only seen him in his bundle, swaddled. Um, we didn't see his body. We just saw his little face. And God, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that my husband had said that and asked for that because seeing him unwrapped was when I could see he really was a little baby. And he had long fingers and really big hands. And he had such cute feet. Um, and he was tiny. So he was three pounds, eight ounces. So tiny. Um, and I don't know if that had to do with anything because we don't have any answers right now. But it was so great to see him. And the other thing that happened was somewhere along the line was deciding what funeral home. We were going to call. That is something I didn't even think about. And if we wanted an autopsy done, and I just didn't think, like, you know, that this was what was happening, and these are the decisions that we had to make. And so we did decide to do an autopsy, which we don't have the results of yet. And they did uh, prepare us that, you know, usually you don't find out any answers. So knowing that, we still did it because we're hopeful that we'll find something. Um, but usually, like, typically the placenta is what gives you the most answers. Um, so we just, we got an autopsy and then we had to decide what funeral home to call. And I like, think I remember saying, um, you know... I literally think I remember saying, like, what? And just thinking, like, they take <laughs> they take our son, and he's just so happy and still there. Um, but that's not the case, obviously. So we decided, and we decided we'd get him cremated as well. Uh... So we had to make those choices and decisions and it was time for us to go like we I was in good shape I guess I was in good shape physically uh, so we left at around 11 a.m. 12 p.m. that that next day so I got to the hospital at 2 left at 11 the next day not even 24 hours in the hospital and we left without him And that's crazy to think about, too. <laughs> and I just remember knowing that going home was going to be super hard because his room was set up and we had this beautiful sign of his name, Briggs Thomas, that was made for us by his godparents. And my husband and I just looked at each other and we were like, we couldn't do it the sign. That's like all we could think about. So we got home and uh, I just went straight to bed. I went straight to bed. Because that's all I could think about doing. Um, and I, unfortunately, when you walk down our hallway, the end door is Briggs' room and our room is right next to it so 
you know, there was no avoiding it. And I just remember sobbing. Because that's... I was supposed to have a baby in my arms. And I was supposed to bring him into his room. But we didn't. And... That's it. That's literally it. <laughs> um, so it's now five weeks later. We still don't have answers from the autopsy. We haven't been sitting here every day, um, you know, agonizing over it. We're just, it is what it is. Um, but I made, like I said in the beginning, is I, I made this video for future women who unfortunately have to go through this. Because you don't imagine this. You don't think about this. You don't, you're probably posting pictures of your cute belly, which I did. Um, and I just really want to wait, raise awareness of like, the fact that anything can happen and like we're not guaranteed or granted anything like we have to be at the mercy of nature and that is really tough that's really tough to know and understand um, and not even to understand because I don't think I'll ever understand that. Um, but I do have a totally different perspective of we're never guaranteed things. Um, and this is absolutely not fair. And that's the way it has to be. And I hope to God that we just continue to learn lessons through it. I'll say we've already learned lessons, um, which sucks. I didn't need this to learn a lesson, but I do have it now, so I'm sure I'll be grateful for it one day, uh, for the lessons. Um, I'll tell you that I'm a person who rushes around all the time and um, is so focused on getting things done and time and, you know, so attentive to others. Um, and I'm not sure things will change back. Um, but I am just grateful to wake up every day and to have the sunshine. And if I get somewhere late, I get somewhere late and it's okay. <laughs> it's not the end of the world because this this seems like the end of the world I'm far more patient I could wait for anything uh, but I mean that's it and I think I've learned a lot about how grateful I am for my husband. I was in the hospital and all I kept saying was like, I'd never be able to do this without him. Never. I feel sad for anyone who doesn't have, you know, every relationship is different, but to not have a strong relationship, um, going through something like this is tough to think about and I'm just super grateful that I'm able to have super strong relationship with my husband and it's made me love him more which I say is odd <laughs> um, I'm not a lovey-dovey emotional person towards him whether that's out of protection of my feelings or not I'm not sure um but we have 
gotten even closer um, throughout this. So I'm super thankful for that. Uh, we have an incredible support system too. Friends and family and our jobs who have been really great in understanding. Um, but to those people and to the people who have loved us and supported us, I'm also really sad for those people. Um, we wrote, we ended up writing some thank you cards. Um, and we just like, we have a room full of sh strollers and car seats and crib. And I'm like, just so hopeful that that stuff will get used. And the only reason I'm hopeful for that is because I've read so many stories of pregnancy after stillbirth. And I've yet to experience it. I've yet to know if it's true or if it will be true for me. God, I really hope it is. Um, I know I'll... Pregnancy will be super hard. If I'm fortunate enough to become pregnant again. Um, it will be super hard. And I'll be so grateful for it in such a different way, but it will come with an insane amount of anxiety as I had my baby with me for nine months. If you are still here and still with me, it's funny, I actually didn't even think it would be this long. <laughs> um, thank you. I wanted to share a couple other things. Um, I'll share a picture or two, I'm not sure yet, um, of my husband and I with Briggs. And I'll also share um, another detail about why this song is on repeat in the background, um, Rise Up by Andre Day. Actually a song that people have probably become more familiar with as it's being used. Um, in the context of the COVID pandemic. Um, so, at the most significant moments, uh, this song played over the loudspeaker in the hospital. One was when I was talking about the options for birth um, and when I was crying about how I can't do this, about how I couldn't do it. This song decided to play over the loudspeaker in the hospital. And then the other time I distinctly remember it playing uh, was when Briggs was, we had said we're, we're okay with Briggs going um, and leaving us for the last time. And literally, like I, I can't make this up. Um, this song, Rise Up, started to play as the nurse is carting him out and he's going through the door. Um... And I did ask the nurse, I was like, why is this song playing? Uh, and it actually played every time they released a COVID patient, but just the odds that the song would play in the worst moments <laughs> was just crazy to me. Um, and so the fact that we had that song playing at some of the worst times, um, it was really great. Now I listen to that song every single morning um, as I get ready for my day. And it helps a lot to just like feel breaks with us. Um, so that's why this song is playing in the background. Um, but If you are a woman who's watching this because you just experienced stillbirth and you're wondering how you'll survive, I don't know. 
I just know I have survived. And at some points, it seems crazy. It seems crazy to think that I'm still here. Because probably the first month, I could care less if I died. Truly. But I am here, and it's not going to be okay until it's okay. And I just encourage people who ever have to stand beside someone who is grieving or having this experience um, to just listen. You don't have to say anything because <laughs> there are no words. There's none. Um, just listen and be cautious of what you say. Um, be cautious of what you say because everything happens for a reason or you'll go on to have beautiful babies while it may be true because I think it's true I don't think it's the right thing to say to someone who's grieving in this really traumatic experience um, and there's probably a lot more I could say I could go on I could go on forever but uh, I won't so share this video um, super uncomfortable I'm not normally one to make videos I'm very I'm, it's, I'm an incredibly open individual probably too open um, as some people <laughs> may think um, but share this video and um, I mean just like love love people around you and remember that you don't know what people have gone through I don't know what people have gone through um, and as we walk around places that we can walk around to five weeks later no one would know that we just lost our son So, be gentle. You know, be gentle to people. You don't know their story. Um, you don't know what they've experienced in life, and just be kind to them. And that's something that I'm sure I'll need reminders of in life, but I hope I can carry and, and fulfill going forward. Thank you for sitting here and listening to this, and I really hope that one day someone watches this and knows that they can do it, and they can get through it, whatever that looks like. Whether it's diving into books like I have done, or trying to continue to work on my dissertation like I've done, um, you can get up. Thank you.